welcome back to the Biostock studio, where we are now joined by Rare Disease Company Obliva and its newly appointed CEO, Ellen Donnelly. Welcome, Ellen, and uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thanks, Cecilia, and thank you to Biostock for this opportunity. I'm excited to tell you the Obliva story. Um, so I'm Ellen Donnelly. I joined Obliva in February, and I come to Obliva from another biotech company in Sweden called Modus Therapeutics, where I was the CEO for three years. My training in drug development came from um, almost a decade at Pfizer, and I have a PhD in pharmacology from Yale. Excited to be here with you today and tell you the Obliva story. So Obliva is focused on the development of therapeutics for mitochondrial medicine or diseases of primary mitochondrial disease. These are rare diseases um, and rare diseases bring opportunities in both the regulatory space and in the commercial space. So a neat opportunity here with the company. We have a strong team of experienced drug developers that are based in Lund, Sweden, and the research comes out of Lund University. We're a publicly traded company and we're traded on the NASDAQ Stockholm. Here you can see our portfolio. Our lead asset is KL1333. This is a partnership with a Korean company called Yungjing. Um, and you can see that we're just completing our phase one studies right now and about to head into a phase two, three study later this year. The second program is NV354. That's targeting a, a primary mitochondrial disease called Lee syndrome. And that's just finishing preclinical development. And then we also have another exciting portfolio of programs in the discovery space. KL1333 has orphan drug designation in the US and the EU. And so that means that the regulators will help us get that to market um, more quickly than in a normal drug development program. So what are primary mitochondrial diseases? You may not have heard of these because they're kind of new to our understanding. These are devastating rare diseases with severe symptoms and continuous deterioration. They, re they have DNA defects that cause abnormal oxidative phosphorylation and this causes patients to have a low level of energy. There are no approved drugs for these indications and patients are really needing new medicines. The space doesn't have very many competitors. You can see our competitors here. Um, we see our chief competitors as MitoBridge and Renio, but they both have a, a drug that has a different mechanism of action and they're looking at treating a different population of patients with PMD. Um, you can also see Stealth Pharmaceuticals. They have a phase three program that had just failed in the area. And so those are kind of the programs that we use to learn, um, learn for. There have also been a number of notable transactions in this space with MitoBridge being acquired by Astellas for 250 million upfront and Renio just did a series B for about 95 million US. So there's obviously a lot of investor interest in this particular area. One of the things that we think is really important to differentiate us from our competitors is our um, ability to put the patient first. So everything we do at Obliva is focused on the patient. We're in constant contact with them and the KOLs to try to understand what is needed in this space. So in our patient-centric development program, we collaborate with patient organizations. We participated in an, an important meeting with the FDA called the Voice of the Patient. Um, we're doing a patient registry study using the UK MITO cohort, and we're also about to embark on a patient study that will validate our primary endpoint for our upcoming phase two, three study. We're also very focused on recruiting the right patient because as many of you know, drug development's often not successful because we just didn't pick that right patient for the clinical study. We believe that um, selecting that right patient will help us in this disease area. So we're looking at two specific types of mutations and diseases, KSS CPEO spectrum disorder and the Mellis mid spectrum disorder. So we hope by targeting these particular patients with primary mitochondrial diseases, we will have a more homogeneous group of patients in the study and a higher likelihood for success. Um, this also reduces the competition we see from our competitors who are going after different patient populations. And although we're picking a very small indication, it still has a big commercial opportunity. So we believe that the opportunity here could be over a billion dollars US. We have a strong advisory network, and this is particularly important in the rare disease space where it's important to get the input of both the patients and the physicians as you work on your development program. So here we've highlighted a number of the people that have been involved in thinking about and designing our clinical program. 
We also have a strong team at Obliva. You can see the core team here. We have a large number of people with experience in mitochondrial disease, both Magnus and Eskil, and they bring over 20 years of drug development experience to the table in this area, so that's neat. Um, you can see everyone smiling. It's a passionate group of drug developers, and I think we, we managed to have a good time while we're doing it, so that's important. We're also um, supplemented by a strong board of directors. And so these people come and help us um, when, we need, when we need their assistance. So it's good to have their support as well. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our lead asset. This is called KL1333. So, so what does this drug do? I'm just gonna tell you a bit about mitochondrial diseases in general. So we know that di dysfunctional mitochondria don't produce enough NAD+. And you can see in this diagram here, the conversion of NADH to NAD+. We know in patients with mitochondrial disease that this is disrupted. Um, and the disruption of this, this production of NAD+, NADH ratio, causes a decrease in energy production and a decrease in mitochondrial biogenesis. Why does that matter to the patient? Because they have, they have very little energy and this lack of energy is often followed by organ dysfunction and disease deterioration. So in developing the program, the first thing we wanted to see is our NAD plus levels really reduced in these patients. And so here you can see some data from a publication in 2020 where you can see the NAD plus levels in the blood of patients shown here in red are much lower than the patient than the um, NAD plus levels in the blood of the control subjects. Here again, you can see that same thing confirmed in the muscle where we have a lower level of NAD plus in the muscle of the patients versus the subjects. And here, this data goes one step further to show you that that's actually important in function. So here you can see again that the NAD plus supplement, this time done through the addition of niacin causes beneficial effects. And you can see the strength um, increased in the, in the patients when given niacin. So what does our drug do? Our drug is gonna correct that underlying pathophysiology. So what KL1333 does is acts in the system and brings additional NAD plus, or allows the creation of additional NAD plus in your system. And it, it goes through this cycle a number of times. So we actually have quite a long half-life of the drug, which is nice when we're talking about dosing patients. It allows you to dose them once a day instead of more frequently. And by giving the patient KL1333, we get new mitochondria formed and restore the energy production. Um, and that's really nice because it hopefully will lead to a reduction in symptoms and potentially even lead to disease modification for these patients. Here we show you just a bit of data um, in patient fibroblasts. So these are patient fibroblasts taken from patients that would actually be included in our study going forward. These are MELIS patients. And you can see in the first diagram over here on the left, we have the wild type fibroblasts, and then we have the diseased fibroblasts. And then you can see if we add our drug KL1333 to the diseased fibroblasts that we restore the ratio of NAD plus. So you can see that we've come up almost to the original level. In the figure on the right, you can see a similar type of change with respect to mitochondrial mass. So once again, we have normal patient fibroblasts, patient fibroblasts that have MILAS, and then the restoration after they have KL1333. So, so what are we doing? Right now, the company is very busy, focused on de-risking our upcoming phase two, three study. So one of the exciting things that happened last year is we had FDA feedback that said that we should go straight into our registrational study. So this means that instead of going into a phase two study followed by a phase three study, we could go into one study um, and, and look for approval of the drug if that study is positive after that one study. So a huge, huge vote of confidence um, in, in our plan, and it allowed us to start a number of important activities. So you can see all the things in the circle that are going on right now um, at the company. It's a very exciting time for Obliva. 
just to highlight some of the things that we are doing, the company started a phase 1A, 1B study late last year, which was kind of remarkable given that it was in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. The study has gone very well and is, is due, to, due to finish quite soon. You can see that it was four, four parts in that study. We did healthy volunteers in part A. Then in part B, we looked at um, establishing the PK profile. Part C, we actually looked at some patients. Um, so we dosed a number of patients with a KL-1333. And then part D is actually exploring the difference of dosing the patients once a day versus twice a day versus three times a day. Um, so that study, again, is, is just finishing. We're also running a drug-drug interaction study. This, show, this will allow us to show that our drug KL-1333 doesn't interact with drugs that are normally taken by this patient population. That's obviously important to increase um, patient comfort in, in entering our study and also our comfort in knowing that we have a safe drug. Um, we're running a natural history study. This is, show, this is looking at patients with primary mitochondrial diseases and ensuring that we can find the patients we need for our study. Um, and we're working on a qualitative interview study and that will help us understand the importance of our primary endpoint fatigue on patients and understand and validate that as a primary endpoint for our new upcoming study. This is the upcoming study. As I mentioned earlier, this, we expect this to start at the end of the year. We're gonna look at these two genetic populations of patients. It's gonna be a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled um, study, and the patients will be on active treatment for 12 months. Our design is an adaptive design, and it'll include over 100 patients. And we're looking at endpoints from primary patient-reported fatigue to um, functional endpoints and biomarkers as well to try to understand what's happening to these patients when they get our drug. Super excited about that. And again, that'll kick off at the end of this year. The second compound in our, in our portfolio is NV354. So NV354 is going to target a different patient population. These patients have Lee syndrome. And this is a syndrome that develops very early in life. Um, you would get diagnosed as a baby, and the baby has severe multi-organ deterioration until they die, usually before age five. Um, it's, it's a fairly uncommon disease, another orphan disorder. And we believe in this disease that energy replacement therapy will actually modify the course of the disease. Um, that this is a neat area as well, because we believe that this drug has opportunity not only in Lee syndrome, but other primary mitochondrial diseases as well. So what's this one doing? So we have a prodrug of succinate here, and what's happening is this prodrug is actually bypassing part, part of your electron transport chain, which you can see is complex one here. So by doing that, we, we miss part of the, um, part of the disrupted um, electron transport chain and get the drug back into complex two where it can be useful. This has disease modifying potential. We believe it's going to protect the mitochondria and could protect the loss of organ function, the loss of organ function. And we believe that it will prevent complications caused by the acute energy crisis in these patients. So hopefully today I've, I've told you a bit about the Obliva portfolio. I think we're well positioned for growth as a global player in this space. Um, this is our focus and we're excited about getting our drugs to patients that need them. You've learned a little bit about our portfolio. We've talked about both KL1, triple three, which will start a phase two study later this year, as well as NV354, our earlier stage preclinical asset for, for Lee syndrome. Um, as I mentioned, this is a rare disease portfolio and that brings a lot of opportunities. It allows us for constant conversation with the regulatory authorities and it also brings potential commercial opportunities when we get the drugs to market. We have a strong team based in Lund that are focused on, on developing these drugs and I'm going to be focused in the U.S., attracting U.S. investors, U.S. press to the, to the story. Um, and once again, we're a publicly traded company traded on NASDAQ Sweden. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for your presentation. Well, like you and I both said, you are fairly new as the CEO of Obliva. Could you tell us a bit about what you bring to the company? Sure. Um, so I think the first thing I bring is a, a strong training in drug development. As I think I mentioned, I was at Pfizer for almost a decade, and I think the big pharmaceutical companies are obviously a great training ground um, to learn drug development from idea, basically, to commercialization. 
Um, I also, from that time and from my time after Pfizer, I think I bring a strong network of both investors, international as well as American, and um, a network of leaders in the pharmaceutical industry, which could be helpful as we look to, to move the company to our next step. Um, I also, I've never been happier than I am as CEO. I love the job and I think I bring a lot of passion um, and kind of an entrepreneurial spirit to the position. Well, that's great to hear. You also recently published your Q4 report. What are the most important points in that for Upleva going forward? Yeah, I think, I think 2020 was a hugely important and exciting year for the company. Um, it was really that year paved the way for the growth that we're going to continue to see as we start to develop these therapeutics for mitochondrial disease. I think there are a couple things that I found most important in that report is first the progress that we made on the development of our compound kale 1333 and bringing the new investor Haiti and ventures into the company. I think on the KL1 triple three front, it was an important year because we did receive feedback from both the FDA and the MHRA supporting our plan to move KL1 triple three into patients. And that was hugely impactful for the company because it allowed us to kind of pivot. And now we're developing a drug um, that's going into a registrational study. That's critically important is because if the study's positive, we could be marketing this drug. Um, and that's, that's a huge and important thing for Obliva. I think on the financial front, it was really important for us to bring in a new specialist investor with Hadian um, that showed kind of that they, they gave us the stamp of approval for what we were doing. Um, and I think that that, that, um, that stamp that they gave us is gonna allow us to bring in other new investors, both specialists and institutional, both in Sweden and, and throughout the globe. Um, and that will just help us build the company and give us opportunities to, to do more exciting things in the area of mitochondrial medicine. And in terms of challenges, what do you think the biggest ones are? Yeah, you know, I think my my job as CEO of Obliva is to develop drugs for, for patients with mitochondrial disease. So I see that every morning, you know, I wake up thinking about the patients. But obviously, in order to do that, I think my, my biggest challenge is bringing in financing. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge for every CEO is ensuring that we have the financing available to do what we need to do in the company. Um, and so I'm basically spending my time trying to make sure that we optimize our path forward. We take ad advantage of every opportunity that comes our way and we really maximize the value of our portfolio um, because my goal is to build the value of this company into something that's, that's really impressive for both the investors and the patients and the physicians and everyone involved in mitochondrial disease. So I think that, you know, the role of a CEO is a tricky one because in biotech development, we have a lots of, of um, positive things that happen and a lot of negative things that happen. And I think one of the things that I need to do as a leader of this company is to, to lead the company through those high and lows, um, keeping both the team and the investors excited and, and looking for the larger goal, which is bringing, bringing therapeutics to these patients. And if we finish by looking in the near term, what would you say the most important milestones coming up are for Obliva? I think this year, the probably the most important milestone is, is getting the financing to support the phase two, three global study that we're about to run. So, you know, my primary goal is, is that I think the team is very much focused on KL1333. We have an important set of studies reading out um, in the next few months. And so those important readouts will allow us to go take this drug into the US um, and file our IND there and then start the phase two, three study. So I know the company is very focused on KL1333 and getting um, to that first patient starting the study by the end of the year. So it's an exciting time for the company um, and an exciting time for all of us as we, as we ensure we have the financing available to do that. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Ellen, and we will be right back with the final presentation of this Biostock Live. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia.